This video is about oak savannas, the predominant ecosystem in the southern half of lower Michigan and a small part of Wisconsin and northern Illinois before European settlement. These aren't continuous forests. They are interspersed with prairies, lakes, and wetlands. This diverse habitat results in equally diverse plant and animal communities. Let's get started. Hello, Dr. Mark here. Do you want to know more about the natural world to which we belong? I concentrate on natural history of the Upper Great Lakes region with a little cultural history to spice things up. Videos are taped field trip style. I comment on things as I see them. If this interests you, please subscribe to my channel by clicking the logo at the bottom left corner. Click on the bell so you'll be notified about new videos as I publish them. I also appreciate comments and suggestions. Today's destination is cool down natural areas. It's a kind of a stealth location. The sign is almost, uh, well, it can't be seen from the road. So uh, here's, here's the sign. There are a lot of uh, interesting things here. The uh, Carner Blue Butterfly is found here, which is a, an endangered race of the uh, little blue hair streak. The, uh, I've found eastern uh, box turtles here. The lupin is here, but we're probably a little bit late to see it. Prairie smoke were very late to see it. And the prickly pear isn't blooming yet. Uh, there are several different loops, and it borders the North Country Trail. This is an ant mound. It's about seven feet in diameter. And uh, it's probably one large colony that has been working on this for years. But it isn't the only one around. Right over here is another one. Notice that there is sand. Uh, most of this is sand, but they have uh, kind of, well, chicken grit sized pebbles on top. And they do this for a reason. This happens to be a way of making sure that a heavy rainstorm doesn't wash all of this away. That's kind of like the roof on top of a house. You may have wondered about different kinds of oaks, especially if you're into botany. This one is in the white oak family. White oaks tend to have rounded lobes. If you go over here, this is actually a black oak, but it's in the red oak family. And red oaks tend to have spines or tips on the ends of their well, leaves. And these have been eaten up by some kind of insect, probably gypsy moths, because they love oaks. And there have been a lot of gypsy moths recently. Uh, but the red and the black oaks have uh, pointed... Oh, here's a good one. This is a typical red oak leaf here. Red and the black oaks have pointy lobes on their leaves, and the white oaks and the bur oaks have rounded lobes. Now, the easiest way to, to remember this is a very non-PC thing here. The red oaks have pointy lobes on their leaves, like red men's arrows, and the white oaks have blunt lobes like white men's bullets. The oak savanna is not just forest. It also contains pockets of prairie like this one. Together with wetlands, this diverse habitat is home to a variety of plants and wildlife. 
I will be looking at the sand prairies in another video. In the sign, or on the sign, I should say, uh, there was a mention of the Carner Blue Butterfly. This is a tiny butterfly. It's only about two centimeters wingspan. It's a bright blue, and uh, it generally has two, possibly three broods a year. In the fall, the, the um, butterflies lay their eggs on the wild lupin that's found around here. And as soon as the lupin comes up, the caterpillars start munching on the lupin leaves. The uh, butterflies use the lupins early in the year as a food source. But later in the year, like right about now at the end of June, all the lupins are gone. They've done flowering. So the counter blue butterfly has to depend on other kinds of things. And one of them is this wild Coreopsis, uh, as well as black-eyed Susans. Uh, but they still lay their eggs on the lupin plants, so they need those lupins for one stage of their life, but they can use other different plants as food sources during the rest of their life. We have probably what is the very last of the blooming wild lupins here in the last week of June. Notice these palmately divided leaves over there. Let's see if we can zoom in on that a little bit. Those are seed pods. They look a lot like pea pods. And <clears throat> they twist. When they dry, the, the, there's a, a tension in these pods. I'm a little close up of the flower now. There's a tension in the pods that causes them to break open and release their seeds explosively. So when you see lupins, very often you see a bunch of them like this because of that. This is a field full of anemone type flowers. It grows in a very specific place if you look at where the sunlight is. Just beyond it, out here, is bright sun. This is about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So this particular area, right down here, where all these anemones are, is in the shade from probably 1 o'clock in the afternoon up through sunset. The area up here, with all the sunlight, is in full sun nearly all the day, if not all the day. So the area where these anemones is, is probably a little bit more moist and a little bit cooler. So you, you can get even micro habitats on a hillside. Railroad grades like this one are a common feature in West Michigan forests. Uh, the uh, prior to the Civil War, pretty much all of the logging was done by hand. The logs were felled during the summer, and then they brought horses and sleds in during the winter to pull the logs out to rivers where they would be piled up on rollways. As soon as the ice broke in the river, they would tumble the logs down into the rivers, and the rivers would take the logs to the sawmills. Starting about 1870, they started doing things a little bit differently. They would build temporary railroad spurs, sometimes with wooden rails, into wooded areas, and they would cut all the trees, drag them to the rail lines, put them on the cars, and uh, use the railways to get them to the sawmill. Sometimes they would even build a sawmill on the spot and cut lumber and ship out already cut, rough cut lumber. Uh, this is a pretty high roadbed. 
They usually aren't this high. Many of them were right on the forest floor or just above. They would fill in low spots with soil from nearby. And very often you'd see pits within 10 feet or so of the railroad grade. These little pits are called swede holes because at the time, in the 1870s and 80s, when a lot of this was being done, they were hiring people from Scandinavia to come over here and do the logging for them. They promised them if the, they, would, they would bring them over for free, uh, the, the men. They would put the men to work for three years and they said at the end of three years you will have made enough so that you can pay for your family to come over here. Not only that, but we will give you a quarter section of cleared land for you to farm. And that was how Michigan was settled originally. But this forest land is not very productive farmland. It would play out after 10 or 15 years and then the farmers would just go somewhere else. Um, off to the west, to Iowa, to Minnesota, to the Dakotas. And uh, so they would leave these farms. The farms would go back to the government for non-payment of taxes. And by the 1920s, nearly a third of Michigan was owned by the state because of this. During the Depression, the um, CCC replanted a lot of these areas in pine plantations, like what you see here. This is a big pine plantation. We have four national forests, two, well, three completely in, the, in Michigan, two in the Lower Peninsula, one on the Upper Peninsula, and then the far western end of Upper Peninsula also has a fourth national forest in it, all planted by the CCC in the 1930s. Small chunks of oak savanna, like Coolbaugh Natural Area, still exist here and there, but much of it has been converted to agriculture in one form or another. Fortunately, in the western Lower Peninsula, we have Manistee National Forest. Although some of it has been planted in pine, much of the mixed hardwood forest is left intact with only selected trees being cut. If you appreciate what I do here, please be sure to like the video and subscribe. If you have ideas for videos or other ecosystems or natural history topics that you want explored, please leave them in the comments.